You are listening to The New Man, Beyond the Macho Jerk and the New Age Wimp. Your host is men's coach and group facilitator, Trip Lanier. Are your life challenges a gift or a burden? Are you a victim or a victor? How can you find your purpose and live with more courage today? This week, Sean Stevenson joins us on The New Man. We'll learn about living large from a guy who is literally three feet tall. Welcome to The New Man. Today I've got Sean Stevenson. He's a board certified therapist that speaks all around the country. He's an author and he's worked alongside President Clinton, Tony Robbins and Oprah. Sean, welcome to the show. Uh, thanks for having me on. So oh, it's times like these. It, it's, there's, a, there's adversity out there. But I'm looking at you and I'm like, wait a second. This guy's had some adversity. Share a little bit about the challenges you've had in your life. Well, the cards that I would dealt, which we'll get into uh, how I've interpreted them over the years, but the cards that I've been dealt were, I was born with a rare condition where my, um, my bones were affected in the growth and the strength. So I was told that I was going to die at birth. My parents were basically prepped and ready for losing their child. And then since then, I've proven those doctors wrong because they're all dead now and I'm speaking to you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and the condition gro- um, stunted the growth of the bones, so I'm only about three feet tall. I don't have the leg strength because the bones are not dense enough to walk on them, uh, so I use a wheelchair for mobility. And the bones were fragile enough that over the years, by the age 18, I had fractured over 200 times. So something as simple as sneezing. <sighs> would fracture a rib, coughing hard would break a collarbone. So I grew up um, most of my childhood in excruciating pain. Wow. Wow. Yeah, it was quite a wild ride. But you know what? Uh, Now I'm going to talk about the interpretation of all that. I live a very large life. I get a lot of shit for this, but I really do say and believe that I lived the life of a rock star. Um, And I'm about (laughs) to prove that on national television with my own TV show that's coming out in the fall on A&E called Three Foot Giant. And it took 200 bone fractures to prepare my mind and to give me the threshold for pain to be able to handle the workload and schedule of what I do now in my life. I run about five different companies underneath the umbrella of Sean Stevenson Enterprises. We are influencing change on this planet by teaching individuals that the greatest thing that has ever held them back is their victim story, their belief in that they did not get um, a fair hand dealt to them. And I think that that is total BS. I believe that that there is no such thing as fair. I think fairness is an illusion that keeps people playing small their entire life. Yeah. And I believe that you need to be a giant in your life. And as a giant, I believe that it is your responsibility to live as a victor, not a victim. And the difference is this. A victim thinks that things just happen to them and it's all outside of their control. There's nothing they can do and, and the reality affects them and that's just life. A victor believes that they have control over their reality, control over their destiny, and believes that even down to their thoughts, that their mentality can create their reality, which is exactly what I've done. And now, granted, I have, you know, more and more haters growing around the world because as you start accomplishing your dreams and living life large and being fully expressed, that makes people nervous because it reminds them of what they're not doing with their life. And I'm learning to adjust to that because I didn't have any people hating me growing up necessarily. And now that I'm playing on a bigger and bigger field, I'm realizing there's a, there is a small a minority of people that are very angry and therefore try to find targets to blame their problems on. And so I've, I've seen and heard it all now, and I'm, uh, I'm growing to learn to love my bullies and build a business amidst their opposition. I got a question. What, have you always had this mentality or was there one day where you woke up and you're like, you know what? Enough of this victim stuff. Well, I think there was one day actually. Um, and it happened when I was young. Thank goodness. Uh, I was in fourth grade. I was in Halloween. Uh, I was at home in my house. And I loved Halloween uh, because it was the one day out of the year every kid got dressed up and I got to blend in. 
I didn't, uh-huh. I didn't look different. I didn't stick out like a sore thumb anymore. I got to mix into a crowd. And at that age, I wanted to just put on a baseball cap and disappear in a crowd, and I couldn't do that. Right. So on Halloween, uh, I was getting all excited for the candy, the pot, the party, the costumes, all that. And I was rolling around outside of my wheelchair on the floor, and I caught my left leg on the corner of the door. I bent it back, and I snapped it at the femur. And I was, um, I knew I had four to six weeks to heal. I couldn't go to the parties. I couldn't go to school. I couldn't see my friends for four to six weeks. And my mom came running in the room and she called me down and she asked me, Sean, is this going to be a gift or a burden in your life? And, wow. and that's one intense question for a fourth grader, let alone any human being. And my mom was not a harsh person by any means. She was a very loving person, still is. And she opened my eyes up to the idea that, um, yeah, I'm not going to have it easy, but no one really does. The pain affects us all differently. And that I still love my life amidst that pain. And maybe mm-hmm. the purpose to my pain was to teach others how to get through theirs. So I built a whole career, a whole life philosophy, and a whole mindset with my friends and family that you have complete jurisdiction over the interpretation of what happens to you, not what happens to you. Yeah, it's not like uh, you know when we get to a certain level of success that problems quit showing up. It, it's our relationship to challenges, right? It's, it's our relationship. And as you said, our interpretation of that, was that an immediate shift for you? Or did you have to kind of remind yourself, wait a second, is this a gift or a it's burden? It's always a, a maintenance. You know, when you go and buy a brand new car, it takes maintenance, but still it's a brand new car and it's awesome. Um, so I took on that belief system at like fourth grade, but I've had to maintain it over the years um, and upgrade it get all the systems ready for newer and bigger challenges. When you play on bigger and bigger fronts in life, meaning, you know, you go from, you know, doing things with your community to doing things with your city to doing things with your state to doing things with your country to doing things with the planet, you have to equip your mind, your resources, your finances. You have to get ready for a larger set of issues that will appear. And that's what I'm still upgrading. And because, your insecurities never go away. You just have to stay ahead of them. It also seems like that your community has to kind of meet. You got to be at that resonance level because even for the guy, like I coach guys and there's, he starts to get into a new mentality and starts seeing the world differently. Well, guess what? His, the, the reason why he is where he is, is that everybody around him kind of supports him in staying there. And so there's like a, a bubble you have to burst out of, even if it's really good for you, people around you might want to keep you down. And you were talking about the haters just a second ago. It, I imagine you had to start surrounding yourself with people that also believed this this uh, kind of uh, belief system. Sure. I call them my pit crew. You know, in auto racing, how uh, a car is racing around the track at like 200 miles an hour, every car has to go into the pit. Well, yeah. when they go into the pit, they're at the mercy of their crew, are they not? Yes, absolutely. It doesn't matter how good of a driver they are, how fast their car is, how much money they have, what they believe about themselves. At the end of the day, uh, you know, in the race, they have to stop and rely on a group of people. And mm-hmm. that's what your friends and your coworkers and people you choose to work around are like. And so what would happen if you pulled your car in and the guy who was supposed to fix your tires is not there? and, you know, like abandons you? What would happen if the guy who's supposed to uh, tune up your engine starts poking holes in your gas tank and draining your energy? And what would happen if the guy who's making sure that uh, all the uh, mechanics in the computer side of the uh, car just took a uh, a sledgehammer to it? You would not be able to pull out of the the pit. Absolutely. The same thing with life. If the people that are supposed to support you and love you don't, uh, if the people that are supposed to build you up end up draining you, and if the people that uh, are supposed to help you grow are out there trying to destroy you, you're, you're in the same boat. So yeah. my point is this. You need an A-caliber pit crew of people that say the same things to your back that they say to your face. They want to see you succeed. They're willing to be selfless around you, and they love seeing you succeed and willing to do anything at all costs to make sure you get there, and you, of course, reflect the same back to them. How did you find, how did you build your pit crew? I mean, how did, what was the process like? I'm still building it, and I'm getting cooler and cooler people on board. <laughs> I call them the Shantourage. <laughs> and uh, we're, we're about uh, 70 people strong right now, and they are people that, uh, with a drop of a hat, would, would uh, 
you know, they would go to some Guatemalan jungle and, and uh, cut down trees to get to me if I was kidnapped somehow. Um, and they would be also the same people that if I got in a bad relationship and had to break up and I was, you know, emotionally very in a dark place, they would drop everything and, and just uh, sit next to me while I cried. They're the same group mm. of people. And mm-hmm. so I've, I've looked for two things when I've developed my pit crew when I meet somebody. One is I see what kind of people they associate with already because you are like your friends. And so if somebody appears to be really positive, but their peer group is a mess, then there's something I'm not seeing yet. Mm -hmm. And that's tipping me off. That's one. Two, I put them through a series of tests over time and not like I'm trying to manipulate them by any means, but I'm just trying to see how do they hold up on pressure? How do they hold up when they don't get their way? How do they hold up when they need to do something that doesn't value them, but helps, you know, the good of humanity. Um, I want to see those kinds of character traits come out of them. And over time, I can tell if somebody, what I call an A friend, somebody I always want to be around, a B friend, somebody I need to be careful of because they're shifty, or a C friend, see you later because they're so toxic. <laughs> so it's, it, you know, I don't, I don't think that most people kind of just take an objective look at, at their friendships. Of like, course not, because most people choose their friends based on proximity or history. They say, oh, well, we grew up together. We have history. Well, yeah, what if that history sucks, though, right? And right. proximity, oh, yeah, we're, we're neighbors or we work together. Yeah, well, that doesn't have any level of standards. That's just you're plopped into the earth at the same time in the same place. That's not a level of standards. That's like, it's like when I look at the women that I used to date in my past, same thing, right? I used to date women with two standards. One, they had to be attractive. Two, they had to be fun. That was all I was looking for. I thought that's all you needed. I was so wrong. There's so many more standards. Now I've chosen that a girl has to be dependable. When I say she needs to be somewhere at 7 o'clock, she's there at 645. You know, when I, say, um, when I say that we're putting together a big event and I need her help to be there, she's there. You know, dependability is an un, um, unmentioned trait in this uh, level of mate selection. You know, uh, another thing is, is this woman really warm around children? I don't care if you want kids yourself, but kids are a great barometer of how patient somebody is. Mm. If somebody is totally impatient around children, just wait. They're going to treat you that way eventually. Um, If somebody hates children, then that also usually means that they don't have a big imagination and they can't just play. They need to have Vegas proportions events every night. They can't do anything without everything being catered to them. Mm -hmm. So I'm constantly looking at how do people treat themselves and others, and then I decide whether or not I want to incorporate them in my life. And I don't race into friendships, business relationships, or dating relationships anymore. I have taken the approach that if something is meant to be, it can go slow. It seems like on the on the other foot, it's the reactive. I'm reacting to my environment. I'm reacting to what's coming to me. And your approach is the proactive. I'm stepping into it. I've yep. got a clear idea of the people that I want. Yep. And do they measure up? Absolutely. And it also means that we've got to, it's like, it seems like people are tolerating so much. Like they'll tolerate crappy relationships. They'll tolerate a lot of really stupid circumstances in their life that they could change. And maybe this is where we get into the excuses uh, conversation. Uh, what's it like when you see people making excuses? And, and I, I like what you, the, the whole butt thing. <laughs> <laughs> B-U-T is what we're referring to. Um, I have a new book called Get Off Your Butt. It comes out on April 27th in bookstores and Amazon and Barnes all that stuff. And uh, it's all about how to end self-sabotage and stand up for yourself. We got Tony Robbins, one of my mentors, to write the forward. So it's super awesome. And I'm really proud of this book. And I say that I'm proud of it because we go into the three major butts to hold people back. And that's your butt fears. But what if I fail, right? Uh, then we got butt insecurities, but I'm not tall enough. I'm not rich enough. Uh, all those excuses. And then butt excuses based on that I don't have the time, the money, the energy, the resources, blah, blah, blah. And so... You, you can have anything you want if you want to get off one of those three butts in life. But those butts are cushy. They get us to be left alone. But that's all they ever leave us. So now when we're talking about excuses, the biggest thing with excuses is an excuse gives us short-term pleasure. If you ask me to go hit the gym with you, is it going to, um, is it going to take effort for me to go up and do that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Is it going to be easier for me to stay home and... Uh, Watch uh, television? Yeah. Certainly. So, now, short-term, effort can be avoided if you stay on your butt. However, 
if you never hit the gym and you just sit on your, on your couch and watch all television and eat food all day, is it going to have a long-term consequence? Yeah. Absolutely. So you have to trade what you want your pleasure to be, long-term or short-term. And so I always say go for the long-term because long-term pleasure is fulfilling. Short-term pleasure is just gratifying. And that's why I'm much rather at the stage that I'm at in my life right now be in a happy relationship and get to make love to a girlfriend or, you know, a woman that I eventually choose to marry uh, when I'm ready for that than just have a bunch of mindless sex with girls I don't really care about because that's only gratifying and then I'm done and then I'm like, huh, why do I feel no more satisfied about my life? Yeah, and it seems like if I'm going to be tied, if I'm going to actually get off my butt and go do something, I've got to be tied to the purpose. Like, what would have me get off my butt? I'd have to get a clear picture of that. What do you recommend? How do I get a clear well, sense purpose of purpose? Well, is everything. I mean, a woman really is sexually drawn into a man who has found his purpose. This is why when people say, how is it possible that a three-foot-tall man is able to be dating gorgeous, beautiful women that have their life together and have his choice of them? It's not because of my wealth and my banking. It's not because of my visibility. All of that has built over time, uh, but I, I've been getting girls prior to that because I found my purpose, and my purpose is to rid the world of insecurities, is to get individuals, you could say fears and excuses as well, but number one, to rid the world of insecurities, because when you're insecure, you have to prove yourself to others, you have to act like a jerk, you have to do all those things that everybody can spot a mile away, and you think you're a badass, you really look like a dumbass. When I come to individuals, I tell them you have to find your purpose. Of course, the number one question that arises is, well, how do I find my purpose? Well, good question, but the better question is, what do I need today, what do I need to do today to be living my purpose? And, and what you need to be doing to live your purpose is you need to find where you are most happy. And I don't mean gratified, I mean truly fulfilled. For some people, it may be um, being a ski instructor on a mountain in Colorado. For some, it might be running an orphanage in, in the, you know, the Philippines. For some, it might be being a police officer in their hometown. For some, it might be being an artist in New York City. I don't know what it is for whoever is listening to this, but you have to find where you are most happy and then figure out how you can get paid to do that and you found your purpose. And it sounds like it sounds like whenever we get clarity about, you know, I want I'm going to be a, a ski instructor in Colorado and then that's when the the butts show up, right? And then that's where your tools come in. Right, exactly. My tools are uh, show up to let you know that you automatically are going to figure up uh, your, your, all your defense mechanisms are going to get you to want to stop. And the reason why is because uh, human beings have more fear of success than failure. Period. And it, it can we just like I would love to reframe that so the guy gets a, a clear sense of his purpose. All of a sudden, it seems like the world is against him because it wants to keep him in that place. That's his viewpoint, right? Right. But what's really going on is he's being challenged by seeing how bad he wants it. Yeah, and that's the thing is like that doesn't mean it's wrong. Just because you're being challenged and just because it's a it is going to be hard work for a while doesn't mean it's if wrong. You hear no along your path. You're just talking to the wrong person. When people tell me that's not possible, I look them in the eye, I smile, I say, thank you for your time. I'm not militant about it anymore. Uh, and I say, thank you for your time. And then I figure out what needs to happen in order to go above that person. There's always somebody above and below us and therefore and around us and through us and all of that. How do the physical challenges that you've had train you for these interior mental gymnastics that we have to learn how to do to, to pursue our purpose? Sure. Uh, well, I think it's uh, been imperative in my development, in my business, and in my relationships with my family. Because when you're put under a lot of physical strain, you find out who you really are. Because it's like you are, you're just ripping, you're just ripping yourself open. You know, like I, I got ripped open mentally because of the amount of, um, excruciating pain I was under, yeah. the only way to get out was to go through it and to become my own little warrior on this planet to, you know, to, to, to march forward amidst whatever was thrown at me. You know, when people all of a sudden tell me no, or a girl breaks up with me or a business opportunity falls through or whatever happens, 
I just go back and I say, hey, what was the worst day of your life? Oh, that's right. When you had to be raced to surgery and a rod had to be pulled out of your leg with no anesthesia and it felt like your leg was being turned down inside out and you just wanted to die. That really creates law of contrast. So yeah. Therefore, when somebody tries to threaten me, tries to do whatever they want to me, I'm like, really? I'm sorry, but I've already had my worst day on the planet. You're going to have to uh, let go of this battle because you're going to lose. <laughs> so how does the guy at home, does he have to go through what you've gone through to build this resolve? Absolutely not. Experience firsthand is not the best way to learn. It's a misnomer that it is. It's learning from other people's experiences. Look, if you tell me the stove is hot, I'm smart enough to go, I trust you. But when you are rebellion and stupid, or not stupid, but when you're rebellion and naive, you're going to touch that stove because you're just going to be like, I don't care. I'm going to try it anyway. Right. Really? Did you need to touch the stove to learn that? No. You had to really start trusting as smart, uh, informed individuals. So when my mentors tell me, Sean, if you go down this road, that's going to be a legal challenge for you. If I really picked out a great mentor, I'm going to heed their notice. All right, so what is one thing that a guy could do today uh, to, to start to build this resolve? What, what, is, what could he do today? Two things. One, he needs to put himself up against the boundary of his problem, we call it. And the boundary of your problem means you have to put yourself in a position where you are uh, emotionally scared out of your mind um, to get yourself to a position to finally face your issue. And I don't want you to put yourself in harm's way physically. I'm saying get yourself in a position where you actually have to face your fear, uh, whether it's you have a fear of women and you have to just put yourself in a scenario where you have to approach a thousand women in one week weekend by yourself and log the hours and whatever it has to take to get you to be pushed up against the boundary of your problem. If you are somebody who is afraid of heights, go skydive, uh, whatever it needs to be, you know, if you're afraid of snakes, go out and uh, get a, a non-poisonous snake to hold in your hand, whatever you have to do to get yourself in the middle of the, um, the tension that is that is you are most afraid of, okay? okay. All right. Then you have to show yourself that you still lived. Mm. Because as Dr. Paul, one of my friends, says best, when you do things that are courageous, you gain confidence, period, mm. no matter what the outcome is. And I love that because... You know, I just went on my first television date where I went out with a girl on a blind date on my TV show. And I got to tell you, that was really hard. I didn't think it would be a big deal. I go out on dates all the time. But there's a camera crew of three people and 15 others in the background following you around everywhere you go. The camera car, the car is all equipped with cameras. You're wired for sound. Every little move you, you make is tracked. And I just felt tremendous pressure up here that I didn't even think would. But I was able to break through it because I put myself in a position I had no choice. I also, I've never, sw I've never swam before um, from the standpoint of I normally use those children's arm floaties yeah. because my body is weighted in such a way that it was not easy for me to swim on my own. And I realized that I had to, on my first show, swim. And so in my first show, I'm going to show you what happens. So find those things that, we're, that we've got some tension and some fear around, confront them. And then, and then the other part is like, hey, look, I lived. I made it through that. Yeah. Well, where can we learn more about you, your TV show, your books, all of that stuff? Well, the TV show you can find more about in the next uh, coming fall, this coming fall uh, on A&E. I don't know any more about that right now. Uh, the book is called Get Off Your Butt, How to End Self-Sabotage and Stand Up for Yourself. You can get that on Amazon or Barnes & Noble or Borders.com right now. Uh, you can find about if you want to do a breakthrough session, which is a 12-hour session one-on-one -on -one with me where I rip you away from your victim story and lovingly place you into the life you've always deserved. Um, and that can be reached by calling my office and scheduling something with my assistant that's uh 866-294-1582 and, and the website where do we go to find you on online uh, innergamemagazine.com i-n-n-e-r-g-a-m-e m-a-g-a-z-i-n-e.com we have an online magazine for men uh, it's me interviewing all the best inner, uh, guys on inner game and i do a hypnotic induction uh, hypnotic uh, installation at the end of the interview so everybody remembers on an unconscious level, everything they just learned. It's different than any interview or podcast system. It's a, uh, a format that's actually uh, patent pending, and it's just a powerful system that we've turned lives around based on the material that we've discovered. 
Wow. That's awesome, man. All right. Well, I've got a question for the listeners. What are your buts? What are your excuses? What are the things that you're holding back from? What's your victim story? Whatever comes up for you, send me an email, triplinear.com and let us know. Sean, thanks so much for coming and being on The New Man. I look forward to having you back on uh, and learning more about your successes and how uh, you affecting change in other people's lives is, uh, is, is helping the world be a better place. Awesome. It's been my pleasure, buddy. Anytime. Be sure to visit triplinear.com and let us know how we can make the new man podcast even better. Thanks for listening.